Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we are heading to the deep, dark, dense forests of the Pacific Northwest to look at the story of a missing man and the betrayal that landed him there. Chris McCallum and his wife Patricia were out camping, and at one point, she had to go. She would never see him alive again. And what happened out there is, well, I mean, why am I alluding to it? Let's just give it a go. This whole video takes us to Medford, Oregon, a city of a quarter of a million people and surrounded by the beautiful nature Oregon has to offer you. This story, in fact, is, is set pretty close to another one I just told, told you recently enough, the, the story of Tucker Reed. It's all set around the Siskiyou National Park. Endless peaks, rivers, and lakes dense with conifers and oaks. Old woods. A place easy to get lost in, which is in fact what was believed to have happened to Chris McCallum when, on the 19th of November 2012, his wife Patricia reported he was missing. He had been last seen camping in those woods, and when she went to pick him up, he was gone. But not just gone, completely vanished. She had parked a car, but at first she thought she'd gotten lost or ended up in the wrong campsite. It was completely barren, where her husband should be, smiling and happy. Instead, just the eerie silence of the forest, and she began to realize just how far from help she was. She quickly got back into the car, put the pedal down, and emptied the gas tank to get home and hope Chris would show up, maybe even be waiting there for her. In the city of Medford lived the McCallum family. That was Chris McCallum, his wife Patricia, and their two kids. There was Eric, who was Patricia's from a previous marriage, and then baby Cora. They had a nice wee place in the southeast of the city on Clear Springs Drive. But they hadn't been living there terribly long. Chris and Tricia had both been living in California when they went on their first date in 2008. Apparently Chris, he just like pfft, fell in love with her the very first date and then nine months later, they was married. Chris was born in 1978, 33 years of age in 2012. He was always a good husband, great father to both kids, a call center employee by day, cab driver by night, known about town. The family, though, they were struggling to make ends meet. You know, the sausage at the end of the day. Trisha, uh, her plan was initially to join the military. She was going to sign up to be a medic. She ended up having to leave, though, due to a bang, air, walk, my foot injury. And she never got, like, further than the pre-entry program, which meant she got no benefits. And then she would just go on to be a stay-at-home mother to their two kids. Chris's real love, though, I mean, after his wife and kids, of course, was the outdoors, something which brought him from Newport, California, where he met his wife, to Oregon, Medford, Oregon, where Trisha grew up. Camping, fishing, hiking, all that? Chris was never happier than when he was out in the wild, away from the problems at home, financial problems, the job he hated. Out there, he, he was free of it all. And so it was of no surprise at all that the weekend Chris was in fact due to turn 34, Chris, 26-year-old uh, Patricia, she went by Trisha, and then Trisha's stepsister Amber Lubbers were like, hey, you know, it's your birthday weekend, so I'll go out hiking. They're going to go camping for the big day, you know, the great outdoors, maybe a little tuggy in nature. Who knows? Let's be surprised. Now, this was in November, and he was due to turn 34 on November 19th, in fact. But the thing about November tends not to be great for the outdoors. Very wet, very cold, not like ideal camping conditions. It's misty, it's damp, and there's a coolness which stretches from the old woods surrounding. But that was not something which ever, which would ever put Chris off. Rain, sleet, or snow, Chris would be out there. Sometimes he even preferred it because it would be quieter and you would have the trails and the campgrounds to yourself. This was Chris's happy place. He was so excited to be out there to celebrate his birthday. On November 16th, 2012, Chris, Trisha, and Amber pulled up at the Applegate River campsite at around 2 p.m. It wasn't one Chris was terribly familiar with, but that just meant new adventures, and Amber had highly recommended it, as she had been there before. Now this is such a kind of a, uh, an eerie place, not only because it's surrounded by very, very deep forests, but as I mentioned at the top, the uh, Tucker Reed case, that happened nearby. 
In fact, there's a couple of other chapters I've covered here. You have the Cowden family murders, which is a very creepy case. That happened in the exact same area, in fact. So that's two I've covered. And then you've also got Hog, Susan, Monica, face like a slapped arse. That happened right there, too. It's a beautiful place, but there's a fair amount of, you know, blood in the air. But that wasn't on their minds when in Applegate. That night, they set up their tent in there, and they were having a grand old time, all three of them, however. By around 8pm, it was getting cold. As I said, middle of November. Like, real cold, real wet. So much so that Trisha and Amber, they kind of regretted coming. It's like, can we maybe celebrate your birthday somewhere else? Like at a bar? With heating, perhaps? Chris, though, he wasn't having any of it. He was staying. And so at about 8 p.m., Trisha and Amber, they left. Now at the campsite was Chris and all the stuff you would need to be camping. Food, water, adequate protection against the elements, and I do include Bigfoot in that because he did have a gun with him. And so Trisha and Amber said their soggy goodbyes, leaving Chris at the campsite to celebrate alone. He refused to come home and let some rain ruin his birthday. Trisha and Amber drove the hours-long journey back to civilization, got some food, and then some should I. Trisha was up then before dawn to get back to Chris now that the rain had eased off, and she didn't want him to be there too long by himself. At like 5 a.m., Patricia returned to the campsite. Hey, happy birthday! You know, came to, to pick him up after he spent the night there by himself. Only he wasn't there. The camp wasn't there. Absolutely no sign of Chris at all. No tent, no messages, no nothing. It was like in the middle of the night, he upped sticks and vanished into the woods. Or Bigfoot, just... It was on the 19th that Trisha reported him missing, calling up the local police department. Now, she, she waited a couple of days because she was like, it's kind of typical of Chris when he gets like in a bit of a huff, and apparently he was in a bit of a huff when they left because he was like, it's my birthday, I'm determined to stick it out, and they weren't. So he wasn't in the best of mood when they were leaving. And she was like, well, so when he gets like this, you know, sometimes he just goes off and he'll usually be back, but he wasn't coming back at all. Then the search began. Oregon Search and Rescue making the hours-long trip into the wild. The campsite itself revealed nothing, and there were no tracks to go on, even though the ground was wet. So, from there, on the 20th of November, they spread out following the Applegate River, as he likely would have stayed close to it. Nearby was the Applegate Waterfall, and maybe he wanted to be kept up all night by that sound. And searchers and police crept up on it. And off a steep embankment, they could see something colourful at the bottom. It looked like a tent. A deputy rappelled down and cut the side open, and inside there was a body. A body along with blood and shell casings. It appeared to be a homicide. Chris had been shot to death in his tent. He hadn't even had a chance to get out of his sleeping bag. Who had crept up on him in the night while he was camping out there in the middle of nowhere? Before the police could even actually do much though, they had to contact California police because the campsite was just over the Oregon border, so it was in the jurisdiction of Wairika. So somebody had a murder on their hands and now it was a Wairika Popo. Eight-year-old Eric and his little sister, three-year-old Cora, are now without a father. He was a great dad. I wish he wasn't he didn't passed away. I'm, I'm still having trouble with the reality of it. I just had that released to me recently that um, the cause of death for Chris was that he was shot multiple times. Chris's wife, Trisha, did not want to be on camera, but says two weekends ago. We'd gone camping and uh, it got too cold. So she left, but Chris decided to stay behind. He didn't want to leave. He didn't want his camping trip to be a failure because it was his birthday trip. If I would have stayed, I wonder if my children would be orphans today. So I'm glad I came home too. I just wish that he would have come with me. Chris's family were obviously devastated, and the weird thing was he was a taxi driver, and another taxi driver had been shot to death recently. Huey Houston, Medford cab driver, had been shot to death on his birthday, just like Chris a month before. His body had been dumped in a field, and his case remained unsolved. Police did begin to wonder if they were somehow linked, if there was some taxi killer out there, or if it was just coincidence. And speaking of not knowing who this was, how about not knowing who you are? I do. Unless you're using uh, NordVPN, of course. In this day and age of constant security breaches, NordVPN is the best in the business at keeping your online activity safe and sound so you can snore at night. I know you snore. 
I can hear it. Nord has the very best VPN, allowing you to virtually be anywhere in the world. I genuinely do use it all the time because of those heck and can't access this content in your location. Pages that always pop up. So when that happens, I say, uh, come again? Cybersecurity these days is the name of the gosh darn game. And that is where Nord shines with Nord's MeshNet, which allows you to safely access other connected devices no matter where they be at. Essentially, it acts like a local area network, only you don't need to have wires to connect your devices or even be local. And now that it is back to school season, Nord has a very special deal that is just for you. Yeah, you. I even asked if I could have it and they said, no, only you. Using my special link, that is nordvpn.com slash that chapter, you can get an incredible deal. Every purchase of a two year plan will receive four bonus months on top. Get that using this link or the one below. Wow, give free stuff, give me, give me. And of course there is data scanners or how about threat protection, preventing any malicious internet beings from nabbing you. I'm talking malware vising, phishing attacks, ransomware, stealing your IP address. No, not stealing where you pee, which is the toilet, I hope, your internet address. Nord is your all-in-one, got your back daddy. So once again, please use my special link, nordvpn.com slash that chapter, and you can get an exclusive deal that is just for yourself. And with its 30-day money-back guarantee, they gotcha. Thank you so much to NordVPN for sponsoring that chapter. Now let's get back into it. Trisha and Amber were questioned. You know the drill, right? They were the last people to see him alive. They said they were out there, it got wet, it got cold. They left that night, they went home, they got some food. Their stories, their, their stories matched. Detectives are still searching for clues in the death of a Medford man. And at the scene itself, not much to go off of. The campsite had been cleared. Only remained was a glove and some tent poles in the fire. There were, however, a few shell casings around the area. Some were old, a campsite, you know, some yeehaws out there going to yeehaw, but some of the shell casings were brand new and found to come from the firearm that had been left with Chris, a firearm that was now nowhere to be found. Chris had been shot to death in his tent and then everything was thrown off the embankment. Trisha said she had left the gun, so had somebody snuck into his tent while he slept and used it on him. Other than that though, the constant rain washed everything away. Again, the unsolved Cowden murders, which were very horrific, they happened literally on the same lake, like on the same river in the exact same area. The police, though, circle always extends outwards. They searched the McCallum home and found nothing. Though also kind of something. In the washroom, in the washing machine, in Patricia's washing machine, were sleeping bags. In the washing machine, while dirty clothes laid around the place. So why would you washing your sleeping bags? She also said that he had all his stuff with him, including his wallet when that was also found in the house, yet Trisha would say that he must have left in the car and one of the kids found it and brought it inside. Now, it seemed like Chris was a well-liked guy, no enemies, but who would follow him out there? The only wrinkle was Chris and Trisha's marriage, which was how I don't like my whiskey it was on the rocks. The family had been living in California before moving to Trisha's hometown of Medford, Oregon, and they'd been living there for about six months. They'd been staying with Trisha's mother before she kicked them out. So then they went all the way down to San Antonio where Trisha was due to enter the military, but that didn't pan out as we know, ow my foot. Later, Trisha took the kids and moved back to Medford by herself. Her leaving was a shock to Chris. It had come completely out of the blue. Chris ended up following her back to Medford. Chris was completely shocked that she would just up and leave and take the kids, like just abandoning him down while he was stuck in San Antonio with a lease on a house so he couldn't exactly run back after. It seemed like she just completely one day just cut ties with him. And Chris, he had grown up, his parents had divorced when he was quite young, and it was a very difficult divorce. He had been old enough to witness it all, and he didn't want his kids going through the exact same thing he had gone through. He would do anything for them. He was paying all of Trisha's bills, full child support, every penny was going to her. He was working his two jobs, and he was trying to get back with Trisha for the kids, if nothing else. But he still loved her. Had since they went on the first date back in Newport, California. But it seems like, once again, the old is where the problems began. He would send her texts like this. Are you going to live this marriage or not? You run into huge financial crisis. You begin to tell me you love me. Except the day before I pay the bills, you're with another guy. See, Trisha had other plans. She was hunting for an online sugar bondage daddy. That's a word. It appears that while Chris was desperate to get back together and provide, Trisha wasn't interested. 
Whether it was her own dreams falling apart or whatever, she'd come to resent him. Resent, resent where she was in life. She was looking for an escape. She had the collar, her sugar daddy's collar that she'd wear all the time. Uh, as well as so, something she wore kind of like around the house. Wore in front of Chris. Wore in front of her kids. And Chris was not too keen on that. Eventually though, in August 2012, Chris and Trisha reconciled. Moving back in together. And that was going about as well as you think it would. The police really began to hone in on Trisha. She seemed like an odd fish. Then they found a camera, right, that, that, that was on the trail going to the campsite. They wanted to see if anybody else had been there, anybody had been following them, yada yada yada. No one else had been there. And I mean no one. Trisha never went back the morning she said she did to pick up Chris. She never returned to the campsite. Trisha was full of shit. But remember, Trisha was not alone that night. Her stepsister, Amber Lubers, had been there with her. Both Trisha and Amber were taken into custody almost three weeks after the murder of Chris on December 7th. Officials have been searching for clues leading to an arrest, and according to the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office, these arrests resulted from an exhaustive and extensive criminal investigative effort. Trisha's family, however, doesn't buy that she would murder her husband, claiming the arrest is suspicious on the detective's side. They appear to be using some scare tactics and threatening them with everything they can think of with CPS taking their kids and they might scare her enough into signing stuff that it may not even be true. They were getting nothing out of Trisha, but Amber, maybe something. See, Amber, it was taught like, well, she'd crack on her, like an egg on a skillet. She was offered a deal, immunity, maximum of three years for accessory if she came clean. Hard deal to pass, and so she emptied the garbage. Amber was shaking, crying, terrified as she was brought in. She had never been in trouble with the police before, never even stepped inside a police station. And, as she explained it, she was dragged into this devious plot. Can I help yourself, Amber? <laughs> See, you have kids, you have everything to worry about. You have your whole life in front of you. How old are you? 27. Exactly. Do you want me to sign this agreement? <laughs> She's gonna hate me. No, you know what? Look where you're at. <laughs> Look who she put you in. The plan? You know who killed Chris. Yes. Was it his wife, Patricia? <laughs> what did she do? The September before, Trisha had confided in Amber. She wanted Chris dead and she wanted it to look like an accident. She had the emotions, basically, but she didn't. She didn't. She didn't. It was in October that Trisha and Amber and the kids were at that exact same campsite. Amber was showing it to Trisha, and that is where they thought, heck, it's a real good place to kill someone. Obviously, we're both terrified. Terrified of getting caught. Um, we were trying to think of alibis and stuff like that. And... They discussed it and planned Chris's murder. It was, in fact, supposed to happen on the weekend of November 3rd, but Chris and Trisha couldn't get a babysitter. We were planning on going camping. It was for his birthday. Mm -hmm. He really did want to go. Um, he was really excited. Then on November 16th, they went there for Chris's birthday. Amber even took pictures of Chris and Trisha, the happy couple. Then, just a few hours after these pictures were taken, the two women plied him with whiskey. They pretended to drink vodka. It was water. Then, when he passed out, Chris was asleep in his sleeping bag in the tent. Trisha, she grabbed the gun, and she shot him multiple times. Amber was hiding behind the car when this was happening. After the first one, she runs back to the car. It's the second. It's the second one. It's the second clip. I'm up. We're on the tent tent. Or, under the tent. On the back. We were gonna try to put him in the car. To take them to a different place. It was too heavy. So we wrapped them up, dragged them to the edge. They then dumped his body off an embankment. We were going to try to make it look like an accident. To lure him to the edge is what you're saying? Yes. And somehow push him over an edge. That was plan C, by the way. Plan A was to push him off a cliff to his doom. Plan B was. was See, there was the river there, and they were like, hey, Chris, we really want to really want to cross this river, but, you know, we need somebody to go over first with a rope to set it up for us so we can, you know, 
shimmy shimmy. So Chris tried to cross the river with a rope tied around his waist. Amber and Trisha were holding onto it. And at one point while he was like midway through the river, they jerked it, hoping he would slip. Current would drag him down, he would drown. He only slipped a little and he recovered and he was really pissed off saying, hey, you could have killed me. They could have and they did. But why? <laughs> Do I really need to look? She needed the money, and he was saying you'll only get the money if you have me also. She only wanted 50% of that equation. Trisha pleaded not guilty to first degree murder, but with Amber as a witness it was all dog shit for her. Patricia McCallum was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Amber Lubers only ever served 8 months in jail. And that is the end of that chapter, a really sad, spooky story of betrayal being betrayed by, you know, those you love out in the middle of these dark forests. Chris, a guy who just wanted to be there, wanted to be there for his kids. Unfortunately, he was entering the web of a black widow. Or something like this. P pretend I said something to that effect, but it just sounds better than what I just actually said. But for any of you folks in Southern Oregon or in Northern California, here's another case which is in that area, and there seems to be a lot of them. I'll probably cover more. Definitely one involving Bigfoot someday, though I'll probably save that for the podcast. I said it before and I'll say it again, I'm coming for him. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you being here, watching this whole video. It means, it means so much to me. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, hey, listen, uh, next whole video, couple of days, so check it out. But if you can't wait, please check out the That Chapter podcast, where there's links down below, uh, or just go onto whatever you do for podcasts, Spotify or whatever you use, just search That Chapter podcast and it'll come up where there's a whole host of other stories which I tell with my good buddy, Give it a goo, and I'll see you real soon. But, you know, take care of each other. And take care of yourselves. That'd be good, too. Because I love you. Mike out.